Hi, I'm delighted to have with me here today, um, Kathy McEwen, who is the Henry and Gertrude Rothschild Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University, where she is also the founding director of the Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering. She is also an Amazon scholar and is well known for the work that she's done over many years on text summarization um, and many other topics in NLP. So welcome, Kathy, and thanks for joining me. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for having me. So today you lead a large group doing NLP research, but your journey to becoming an AI researcher and an NLP researcher has been an unusual one. Um, if I'm right correctly, you actually majored in comparative literature when you're an undergrad, uh, even though you're also very mathematical, you oriented at the time. So tell, tell, tell us your story of how you became an NLP researcher. Yeah, so when I started out at Brown, I didn't know what I wanted to major in. So I took courses both in math and comparative literature. And as I went on, I, I became more interested in comparative literature probably in part because of the teachers who I had who really influenced me. Um, it was only as I came near the end of my time at Brown that I, and uh, when I graduated, um, I took a job as a programmer, which I found uh, actually very boring. And I thought if I was going to have to be working 40 hours a week. I wanted to be doing something that I enjoyed. Um, and it was then that a friend of mine who was a linguistics major at Brown told me about computational linguistics. And so I spent a lot of the year um, in the library reading about AI and natural language processing. And when I applied for graduate school the following year, I, I knew that was what I wanted to do because it gave me a way to bring together my interests in language and in math. So, so that's fascinating. So as a comparative literature major, you spent a lot of time in the Brown University Library reading about you know, computational linguistics and NLP. Um, Today, we have a lot of learners, maybe some watching this video, that may not yet be an NLP researcher or AI engineer wanting to break into the field. So I'd love to hear more about what your experience was like, you know, reading so much. Were you doing it by yourself? Did you have a study group? Or what, what, what was that like? I was doing it entirely by myself. Um, I really had no guidance in terms of what to look at. Uh, I guess this friend that I had made a few suggestions and then I traced references. You know, when I first began reading, I would follow up on uh, references um, to go further. Yeah. And when I first uh, entered graduate school and, you know, I had essentially switched fields, um, I, I found it very frightening. Um, I was sure that, you know, I was an imposter, that um, I didn't know enough. And before long, they would find out, you know, that I really shouldn't be there after all. Uh, yeah, but that's something, you know, you overcome with time and you learn that it's not the case and uh, people value your input. Yeah, that's really inspiring. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, would you have any advice for someone maybe today that is trying to do this themselves and wondering if they know enough or are good enough or should be in the field? It sounds like you got through that and you've been incredibly successful. But what would you say to someone today, maybe looking to follow in your footsteps and wondering if you know this is right for them or, the, or if they'll make it? So um, I, I guess I have a, a couple pieces of advice. I, I do think reaching out to people and, and talking to people is useful. Um, I, I just was, until I got to graduate school, I wasn't in, in an environment where I had people to talk to. Um, so um, I, I do think it's really helpful, especially to talk to your peers um, about uh, what they're doing and what what they're interested in. Um, 
when you pick problems to work on. And I guess, especially in today's world of deep learning and neural nets, I would advise choosing problems that are different from what everybody else works on. Sort of strike out in a different direction, choose something new, a new task, and and take off from from there. And I think we'd love to come back to the to the different problems talking a bit. And um, when I speak with learners from around the world, I do hear from some uh, that they feel lonely or isolated. They're kind of out somewhere. Uh, maybe not living, you know, in a major tech hub, and they sometimes feel like they're doing this by themselves. So I find it actually really inspiring that you were able to do that by yourself in the in a library in Brown University. Um, I don't know if you have anything, any other thoughts to offer learners that may feel like, you know, they're somewhere in a company or in a city, just trying to do this by themselves. I'm not sure I do have a lot more to say about it. Um, I guess, you know, read what you enjoy about. Uh, if you can be part of a reading group, an online reading group, uh, that would be helpful. There are a lot of reading groups now, and that's that's a good way to get sort of insights. There are online videos and course experiences like like yours. And I think that's a way to find out what's going on and get in touch with what people are doing. So I think um, today the online environment can can help people get connected and hear, you know, what's going on. Um, I, I was lucky. I mean, I was really lucky. <laughs> I, I applied to Penn. I didn't know that at the time it was the best place in natural language processing. Um, and that was, that was totally luck. So I, I don't know that um, I would recommend, you know, doing it blind again today. I think getting advice is, is great. Everyone that's been successful has had many elements of luck. Uh, but the preparation makes you ready to take advantage of when good luck falls into your lap. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. that. That was really inspiring to hear about your early days as a developing researcher. Um, and today you lead the launch group at Columbia University uh, doing very interdisciplinary work and doing a lot of work on summarization and, and other topics. So tell, tell, us, tell us a bit more about your current work and what you're excited about? Um, so I have, uh, I mean, summarization has really been the bulk of my work over the m most recent years. Um, we're, we've done work on summarization of all kinds of different genres uh, from personal novels to emails. One thread of research in summarization that um, I'm particularly excited about is work that I've done with researchers at Amazon and which was published at ACL. And this is work on summarization of novel chapters. Um, it's, it's very new. No one has been working on this task. It's very challenging, very different summarization. So the chapters are much longer than uh, the news articles on which most current work in summarization today is done. And that that is a challenge for current uh, neural models. Um, and a big problem is that there is an extreme amount of paraphrasing between the input, which is 19th century novels, and the output, which is a summary written in today's language, um, none of the current models can handle the kind of paraphrasing that we see there. And that, and that in general, is a topic that I'm, I'm really interested in, is this sort of very abstractive summarization where um, the, the sentences are, are used different words than the input document where the syntactic structure is different. Um, and, and that is 
very different from the vast majority of work today, which is done on summarization of news. Um, and it's done on summarization of news because that's where the data is. Um, so some, some of the other areas that I'm looking at are uh, summarization of personal narratives that you find online where the personal narratives are very informal language and the summary is more formal. Um, summarization of debates. Um, in past work, we've also done uh, summarization of email, which has some of those same characteristics. Why did you choose to work on the uh, novel summarization task? Well, um, so we had done work on novels even earlier, I would say in 2010, when one of my students uh, who was very interested in creative writing and I really thought he should do a PhD. And so to convince him to stay, you know, we, we came to a topic that he would be happy with, which uh, was analysis and generation of uh, creative language. And um, I felt then that my work came full circle, that we collaborated then with a professor in comparative literature. So I came back to my roots in comparative literature and, and that was a lot of fun. So um, when I first went to um, <clears throat> Amazon, I, you know, I, I knew uh, because of Kindle and, and online on Amazon, they have a lot of novels. And I thought, what would be more fun than being able to summarize novels? Sounds like a fun project. I read a lot on my Kindle, so maybe your work will be a feature in the Kindle someday. One aspect of your work that stood out as well is that um, you're known for doing highly interdisciplinary work. So rather than you know focusing narrowly on NLP research, uh, your work has spanned AI and the media, where I know, you know Columbia University has a great journalism school, so wonderful journalists to work with there. Um, or the application of NLP to social networks. Um, I think you work with uh, medical problems. Uh, so tell, 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 tell us a bit about how, how, how you think about interdisciplinary work, because you've done more of it, I think, than, than most NLP researchers have. Yeah, I really enjoy interdisciplinary work. I think it's uh, the most my most favorite kind of research to do. And um, in part, you know, we get a really different perspective on research and the world when we talk to people in other fields. It, it takes us out of our sort of technical, na narrow, narrow field. And so um, earlier you alluded to picking research topics that are novel. And I think your research portfolio has certainly touched on a lot of problems that very few others are working on. So can, can you say more about say, say more about that? But how do you pick research projects to work on? Um, and how do you advise others to pick topics to work on? I think it's important to, to pick a task that matters. Um, so that for me is, uh, you know, one thing to look at. Um, for example, uh, most of the work in text summarization today is done on summarization of what's called single document summarization of news. So take one news article in and uh, generate a summary of that news article. Um, and the reason for that is because that's where the data is. There's a huge amount of data that has been pulled together from first the CNN Daily Mail corpus and later uh, New York Times and um, there are a number of other corpora as well. Um, the problem is that's not really a task that we need. Um, we've known for a long time that uh, the lead of the news article can help people pretty well in serving as a summary of the, of the document. And in fact, for years, it was hard to beat the lead. People um, just worked on, that wasn't a problem that people worked on in the early years of summarization. The lead so, being the first sentence or the first the first, the, 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 the first couple of sentences in the news article. Um, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, people work on a problem like that because that's where the data is. We have leaderboards. People are competitive. They like to beat the leaderboard. Um, but I, I would question to, to is that one or even half a point in Rouge, which is used to the automated metric used to score them, um, really make a difference. If you look at the output, you can see that actually the summaries are are quite similar and either one of them might be fine. Um, so I prefer to go in directions that, that people haven't gone in before and to choose a task where if you solve it, it's, it's going to help people. It's going to be a useful um, application that you've developed. So uh, this, is, this is why I have done things uh, like um, summarization of personal narrative, which we did in the course of, of disaster, so that we could summarize, think of having a browsing view of uh, summaries of what people have experienced after they've lived through a disaster. Um, or the current work on summarization of novels, where it would be helpful to have a, a summary of um, an input chapter. I like to go in a different direction in part because I want to solve the task that matters, but I also like to go in a different direction because in this day and age of deep learning, um, where results come so fast, everybody works on the same problem trying to beat the previous state of the art. Um, it can be hard to be the first one to get there. And if you go in a different direction, nobody else is working on, you are going to be the first one to come to solution. And, and that's what I like to do in my research over time. I like to be first on a problem. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like I have a, for myself, I have a lot of respect for people that can push that extra half point of performance on the leaderboard because hopefully that advances the whole field and lifts all ships. Um, I also have a lot of respect for people with the your know, creativity and the insight to charter the new problem that no one else has thought of and advances the whole field in a different direction. I think you know the, the, the field of AI and NLP is broad enough. I, I think it's actually not a bad thing if we have lots of people working on lots of different things, including oh, the standardized okay. benchmarks and a sure. bunch of new things. That's yeah, cool. sure. I, ju I just, um, I feel that there are not as many people who want to go in that new direction. And it, and yeah. it does, it does take some, um, you know, sort of guts to do it because the first thing that happens when you submit a paper is there's no, you know, there is no benchmark. There is no, uh, baseline of prior work and uh, reviewers have a very hard time dealing with that. Um, you know, how can they judge whether it's, you know, a, a really a, a good step forward? Whereas, you know, if you can show on a leaderboard that you've improved by a certain amount and you stay within the traditional trajectory, uh, it's easier to judge. Yeah, that, that, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, actually, I was recently chatting with um, uh, one of my friends, Sharon Joe, who mentioned that um, sometimes the way benchmarks and metrics are established is that some researcher publishing a paper you know, publishes something using some metric, um, maybe a good one, maybe an okay one. But to make sure that subsequent papers can compare to earlier work, then everyone and more and more people end up using the same metric, uh, more for historical reasons that that it makes things comparable rather than because it is actually the most useful metric. It, yeah. It's funny how metrics get established in academia. Yeah. I mean, that has happened in the summarization field. And I, I think also in machine translation where you want an automated metric because it's easier to develop a system to train over and over again. And yet everybody knows that the automated metrics that we currently have are really flawed. And um, but everyone keeps using them because that's what we've always always done. You know, one of my um, most stark memories was I remember going to a Sig IR, the Information Retrieval Conference, and attending mm -hmm. a workshop in text summarization. And I remember being struck, uh, fascinated, but struck that about half of that workshop was on text summarization algorithms, and the other half of that workshop was on how to develop metrics to evaluate the other half of the work. I, I think it's, uh -huh. a, it, it, it's text summarization especially 
it, the development of automated metrics has been challenging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Hey, so, so it, in, in, in terms of choosing um, new topics to work on, one of the pieces of work that you've been doing that I thought was fascinating was you were taking texts from the uh, Black community from, from Harlem near, I guess, where, where you teach at Columbia University and analyzing that as well. Uh, just tell, tell, tell us a bit about that. Um, this is where I'm moving uh, with my work with the researcher from social work. Um, and we're also beginning to involve a um, linguist who works on African-American vernacular. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at uh, what people say, um, what kind of emotions they express in reaction to major events that are going on today. So, uh, for example, in reaction to Black Lives Matter, and in reaction to COVID-19. Um, so um, th- this is work that we're just beginning. Um, we've be- begun with developing an interface where people can post about um, their experiences with these events and you know ha- how they're feeling. Um, and I guess what we're hoping to do with that um, in part, so we have we have two directions to go. Uh, one on the natural language side is to be able to understand um, how people express different kinds of, of language, uh, sorry, different kinds of emotion um, in African-American vernacular and how that differs from how people express it in standard American English. And, you know, look uh, at, the difference in language and probably even the difference in content in terms of what's expressed. And this can help us in developing algorithms that, um, you know, are not biased uh, as we move forward. Most of the work in natural language, all, all of the systems have been trained on news that comes, uh, language that comes from news like the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, that's great. And if this type of work can help fight bias or build bridges between communities or just yeah. play some role in understanding and advise and, and helping to advance the Black Lives Matter movement, that, that seems like a wonderful thing to be to, to yeah. doing. Yeah. I mean we also want in that in that work to look at the impact of trauma. So it's a it's a different kind of trauma. And sometimes it's not your personal trauma, but the trauma of seeing what has happened to other people who are like you. Um, so uh, yeah, we want to look at how that is expressed and the different kinds of emotions, the intensity of emotion and so forth. And I, I, I find it you know, really wonderful that uh, NLP researchers, AI researchers you know, can play an active role in some of these most important societal questions and issues of our time. It feels like the work we do as AI researchers, it can matter on these really important topics. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. And I've sort of been trying to do that for a while. I think it really attracts students to work with you and often different kinds of students uh, into the field to work with you. Um, on our first work on with... Um, analyzing social media posts of gang-involved youth, uh, we didn't have funding. Um, We did that entirely with undergraduates who were just totally amazing. Um, In earlier work, we were looking at being able to automatically generate updates about disaster as it unfolded. Um, We did that after Hurricane Sandy hit New York. And again, it was something that students came to me And they had seen this happen and they have seen, you know, their neighborhoods hurt or they live through the uncertainty of it and they wanted to help. They wanted to know what can we do. And and that was at at that point in time, this was all pre-neural net. We began uh, developing systems that could automatically generate updates as an event unfolded. Now, and it's actually great to think that, you know, you 
um, don't need a PhD, don't need a long publication record, but an undergrad spotting an opportunity with a desire to help can step in and start to work on systems that 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 can make a difference. Yes, they're really passionate about it, um, and they're they're really good. Very, you know, the work that came out of that was was really excellent. Yeah, thank you. Hey, um, so Chancy, uh, uh, this this is great stuff. Um, and 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 switching tracks a bit, um. You've been working in you know NLP and and associated areas for a long time. Uh, in fact, I I saw that even way way back in 1985, you written an early book on text generation, uh, before mm-hmm. the modern you know neural text generation techniques were yeah. were, were around. Um, so you've been a leader in the field for a long time and seen a lot of things change. I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, how the field of NLP has has evolved over these many years. Sure. So um, when I started, uh, which I got my PhD in 82, so I spent those um, early year, years at Penn. And um, there, there were some characteristics of the field that were, you know, um, salient or um, so... Uh, One of them is that there was a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, There was, in in developing NLP systems, um, we drew a lot on work from linguistics, from philosophy, from psychology, uh, from cognitive science. And so uh, when I was at at Penn, I interacted a lot with... um, uh, faculty from linguistics, uh, Ellen Prince was one of the people, or fa- faculty from philosophy. We we spent time, you know, in these interdisciplinary meetings, and you know, I can remember walking across campus with my advisor to go from the computer science department to the psychology department, for example. Um, I was influenced a lot, and I have to I have to mention this, although it's not exactly what you asked. I was influenced a lot by uh, senior women at the time. Uh, if I look back to who was most influential in in um, you know how I progressed in in my early research, um, my advisor, of course, who was a male, Aravind Joshi, um, but then also. Um, Bonnie Weber, who was there in computer science, Eva Haichova from Charles University at Prague, who was a linguist, Barbara Gross, who uh, was at Stanford at that time in uh, the CSLI uh, Institute. Um, And Karen Spark Jones was very influential to me. She was um, from the field of information retrieval and and she and I spent a lot of time talking about summarization. Um, So interdisciplinary is one main feature of that time. A second was drawing on theories from these other areas. So we drew on theories from linguistics. One um, main kind of theory that we looked at was a focus of attention and how that changed over the course of the discourse and how that influenced um, how you made choices and how you realized uh, text and language. So for example, did you use a pronoun or did you use a full uh, noun phrase? Um, What kind of syntactic structure did you use? You, You might use different syntactic structures to make um, a concept more prominent uh, in the discourse. We also drew on work from philosophy. So there we, we drew on work from theories from Searle about um, intention and work from Grice about conversational implicature. Um, and, and so we looked at these theories and we looked at how we could embody them in our natural language approaches. It's great to hear about some of your early sources of inspiration, much as I think today you will be a source of inspiration to, to many others. So, you know, you've seen a lot uh, and see a lot in NLP, uh, which continues to be rapidly 
evolving field. So I'm actually curious, Kathy, what what do you find most exciting in terms of emerging or exciting NLP technologies? For me personally, some of uh, the work that I've already talked about today on um, truly abstractive summarization that uses extreme paraphrasing um, uh, work on analyzing um, the language from diverse communities. So we've been looking at the Black community, but I think you know there are other communities we could look at as well. Um, I'm interested in things uh, looking at um, how you deal with bias and data. And another very important topic, I think, is being able to arrive at um, what I would call paralinguistic meaning. So um, the pragmatic uh, information about emotion, about intention um, would be another important direction to go. Um, and I, and I also think uh, more work on events, being able to um, understand what events have happened and uh, to be able to follow them. I also think about often if I look back, is it okay if I talk about this now? If I look back, if I look back on, on my favorite technologies and papers, I can, I can think of, of papers from uh, three points in time. The first would be older, and this was very early work on in language generation on how we pick the words um, in our in our sentence. And we saw then that it was a it was a hard problem that constraints came from many different sources. Uh, and uh, we looked at we we wrote a paper called Floating Constraints on Lexical Choice, which where we looked at um, how information from uh, different parts of language, from the discourse, from uh, lex the lexicon, from syntax, from semantics would influence what we chose. And um, I, we worked in uh, two different domains. One was basketball and one was stock markets. And I, I give the example of the floating constraint where we have want to express both the time at which something happened and the manner. Um, in the first example, we express time in the verb and manner in the adverb. So Wall Street indexes open strongly, opened is, is the time. And in the second, we express manner in the verb and time in the prepositional phrase. So stock indexes surged at the start of the trading day. And so we wanted to look at how we could control that choice. And I, I think control is something that's missing in language generation and summarization today using deep learning methods. How do we control control what the output is and make sure it's true to what our intention is? Um, in more, more recent work, my favorite is work on News Blaster, which was, uh, uh, that's still about 15 years ago, but it feels recent to me. <laughs> Um, and that was where we took a real world problem. We did uh, do some collaboration with journalists and uh, we developed a, a test bed where we could um, identify the events that happened for, uh, during the day and produce a summary on each event. And then we also looked at how we could track that over time. And this, this platform gave us a common sort of application in which my students could address really hard research um, questions. And so that was where we looked at, did some of our first work on abstractive summarization, uh, looking at how we might compress sentences, how we could fuse phrases together, how we might reference, um, uh, edit references uh, so that the summary was more coherent. Um, and we also did work on mul multilingual summarization. Yeah. Cool. So, no, great. Thank you. Lo lo lots, lo lots of exciting, very distinct projects over, over the years. Um, do you have any, uh, maybe, let's, maybe I'll wrap up. Do, do you have any last thoughts? You can just say, do you have any final thoughts? Um, well, I guess I would just say that uh, natural language is a really exciting field today. There's been a huge amount of progress with uh, deep learning. We've seen um, dramatic increases in accuracy. 
Um, but we still have a lot of directions to go. And I guess I would like to see, uh, you know, more of the interdisciplinary work being brought back in. I'd, I'd like to see people uh, looking at the data more and at, at uh, their output more rather than just numbers. Um, but I think there are many exciting directions for people to work in. And I hope we'll see many people join the field. Thank you. That was great. And I certainly hope that we'll have a lot more people join NLP and contribute to all of this exciting work. So thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Well, thank, thanks so much for asking me. It was fun. For more interviews with NLP thought leaders, check out the deeplearning.ai YouTube channel or enroll in the NLP specialization on Coursera.